I'm Captain Kirk. Fascinating. <laughs> I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. Thank you, thank you. Love you. Mwah. Most illogical. I saw. Well, that was different. Yep, lousy, but different. Places, please. And here we go. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, bears, Ocampa, and things to episode 30 of the Muppet Trek podcast. I'm Jarman. And I am Steve. We come here like we come here every week to review episodes of The Muppet Show and Star Trek, the original series. That's right. And thanks for taking my line. (laughs) I don't have the thing up in front of me for the first week. I was like, I'm going to wing this, see how it goes. Well, tonight we are covering The Muppet Show with special guest star Rich Little and Star Trek original series episode, A Mock Time. A Mock Time. Yes. A favorite. A favorite of a lot of people. Yeah. Um, But before we get into that, we have some feedback um, from our last episode. Episode 29, we had Nancy Walker and the last episode of season one of Star Trek, which was Mm -hmm. uh, Operation Annihilate. And uh, surprisingly, that is one of our most watched episodes on YouTube by far. Um, I don't know why on YouTube in particular, but tons of people, guess like Nancy Walker or Operation Annihilate. I have no idea. Um, Was it because we did like top star trek episodes like oh, i'm trying to think of key i didn't even put that in the in the description i forgot to so so nancy walker then maybe maybe i didn't even know who she was before i watched that episode so very strange but you know more power to him Killer. but we got a thing on twitter from a guy named chuck t 43 um in regards to that last episode and he says um well i hit the follow button please be about trek not trump fingers crossed or separated live long and prosper emoji as he put at the end okay so i guaranteed him with the response that we have nothing to do with trump on this podcast we're just talking about muppets and star trek so that's it like i don't think yeah i mean no yeah just here come here for the trek and the muppets you got it man so we hope you're still listening and that you follow us everywhere here for escapism man that's right escape from the 2020 which is terrible yeah Oh, boy. Let's all so, run from it together. <laughs> so tell us about The Muppet Show tonight, which we have uh, Rich Little. Who is this guy, oh, Steve? Rich Little, discovered at 17 doing impressions for a talent contest. He made his way to Canadian television. He then spent some time as a DJ and released a few comedy albums. He had his big U.S. breakout when he appeared on The Judy Garland Show in 1964. Oh. And he got extremely popular towards the end of the 60s and the early 70s because he got famous for his uh, Richard Nixon impression, which you uh-huh. get to see it here, actually. In the 80s, he kind of stepped back a bit and actually began specializing in in dubbing dialogue for older actors who were too ill to perform uh, Hmm. or doing ADR for people who died. Oh, my God. For completion. (laughs) That's a great job. It kind of became the thing he did. Um, In one case, he actually dubbed over Gene Kelly because he had lost his voice. Oh, yeah. He has a Gene Kelly in this episode, too. He does. Uh, after that, he did a big run in Vegas and even hosted the White House Correspondents Dinner in 2007. But the reviews basically said that uh, his impressions weren't relatable because most of the people were dead or irrelevant now. <laughs> <laughs> so what does our generation know him from? Besides doing Nixon's voice in things like Futurama and Baby's Kids, not a whole lot. Mm, so he was the Nixon in Futurama. Uh, yes. Uh, he was on a lot of episodes then because that comes back. Or quite he a bit. was Nixon on at least a few of them. Gotcha. Um, Backstage this week, Scooter calls for Rich Little. We get a bunch of outdated impressions, as mentioned, and then a monster comes out saying that he'll be ready to go on, and Scooter's really impressed. The rest of the backstage plot this week centers around the fact that Gonzo is uh, auditioning chickens for a dancing chicken number. You get multiple check-ins with him, finally convincing Kermit to let him go out after somebody cancels, and he goes out, and the the the, the performance is very, very unimpressive. <laughs> but to Gonzo, it's amazing. God, so it's amazing, but it's very unimpressive <laughs> to everybody else. Backstage. Also this week, we get a, a sketch kind of where Rich is bombarded by uh, um, photographers and uh, paparazzi uh, and gets asked to press to do a bunch of impressions. And it's just him doing his shtick some more. <laughs> <laughs> oh You're not wrong. And to the point of disconnect where I reckon I recognized half, I think, <laughs> of the impressions. Yeah. And I'm probably more knowledgeable than like most people because I was looking at articles about this while I was watching it. And you've watched a lot of classic Muppets and stuff. A so little you... bit more than most people. Yeah. Certainly, I guess. Uh, on stage this week, however, it's a little bit better. Uh, Kermit introduces Rich a little, but first a musical number, Chanson de Moore, uh, performing Lady Whatnots, accompanied by Crazy Harry, providing the da 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 
uh, and some explosions for emphasis. Rich comes out and does some impressions. This starts a really, really bad Fozzie Bear impression. Oh, God. And yes. then a really bad Waldorf. And then a really, really bad Kermit. Oh, I will say the Waldorf was the closest. At least it was like a caricature. It wasn't in any way the voice, but the other ones were so off. And it ends with an incredibly bad Miss Piggy. Piggy storms out thinking Kermit's talking to another lady pig and she chops Rich and then they chop each other. Yeah. Yeah. I will say he came out as Fozzie and I had no idea who he was supposed to be. I'm like, who is this like a comedian? He's impersonating. So bad. It was, it was awful. Uh, At the dance this week. It was great. Uh, Animal finally kind of gets his comeuppance and takes a repeated beating on the dance floor only to be blown (laughs) sky high by crazy, crazy Harry at the end. We get a, uh, a classic, um, uh, the glow worm. Uh, we see a lizard singing a song to himself, eating up worms that pass him by. Finally, one worm gives him a little bit more than he asked for, pulling up the worm further and further, only to reveal that it is a very large nose of a big monster, mm-hmm. which then eats him. <laughs> we get veterinarian's hospital where the patient is a bear, but somehow everything devolves into jokes about horses. <laughs> I loved it. Kermit introduces Gonzo and Lolita, the dancing chicken. The chicken barely moves. It's really bad. <laughs> it's really funny. Gonzo unconvincingly tries to get Lolita to dance, um, but she doesn't cooperate. Uh, but however, the audience has a lot of chickens in it for whatever reason, and they love it. Uh, we get scenes from great Hollywood musical comedy, Singing in the Rain, joined by Fozzie. He does Cary Grant and John Wayne and maybe one other. I don't know. The scene switches to Kermit and him singing Well Did You Ever, where he does Sinatra and Bing Crosby. And finally, we get Piggy and him singing I Remember It Well. And I honestly don't know if he was doing a voice here, if he was being himself. He was being like a French guy, but I don't know who the hell it's yeah. supposed to be. Maybe it was supposed to be Charles Aznavour. <laughs> That'd be a good callback. Uh, Kermit thanks Rich at the closing curtain one more time. He comes out and does a chicken impression, which Gonzo loves. And that is what we call the Muppet show. Jarman, what did, what did you think of this week's episode of the Muppet show? So (laughs) mixed bag, um, as we've already kind of shown and uh, given away the lead here that, uh, we did not think much of rich little's impressions. Um, the ones he did best were some of the one like, older people um yeah bing crosby was good and that's what i was saying I is that know. his he was not i don't think he connected with the muppets very well either and his he said one shtick and his impressions were typically not that great um and then the ones that were actually good i really enjoyed his singing impressions they actually were pretty spot on or pretty close at least like he did a good frank sinatra great dean martin and right. bing crosby like that sounded pretty on but they didn't give him much time on those and so then when he jumped back into that weird French guy and, and then he just never really connected or had a number I was I cared about. Um, so then but the rest of the episode with just the Muppets, for some reason, I was laughing a lot of this episode. Um, mm. I love the the vet hospital episode this time around. The You always do. I do. But this one in particular, I thought was just ridiculous and fun. Um, and then the. I love Gonzo auditioning chickens because it's kind of like the building love story between Gonzo and chickens in general. So um, I liked, I, I really did like the, um, the him auditioning part and the quick cuts back and forth. I really did like that, but the payoff for the performance was just, it wasn't what it needed for whatever reason. It wasn't what it needed. I always thought it was funnier because we built up to this and it's like, Oh, he's, he has a number now. Like something's going to happen. And then we cut to it and really nothing. <laughs> it's true. It's just a, a chicken on stage to music. That made me laugh. And then the, actually the first part even surprised me when it cuts to the chicken that comes in to audition. It's an actual chicken as opposed to a, a Muppet chicken. A puppet chicken. Yeah. True. So I was like, oh, okay, this is going to be different. <laughs> but overall, the biggest thing was the lizard and worm number. Like I just, for some reason, even my girlfriend watching it, she's like, she loves those worm puppets. She said when she saw that, because apparently she's made them with her students before she's a drama teacher. Um, and it's just, they, it's such a small little thing moving that little worm, but it looks so cool and so real. Like it had life of its own. Um, and it was just creative and cute and funny. And I really enjoyed it. So maybe the Muppets in general is just growing on me or season two is just better in general. I don't know. Season two, you're going to feel it. And then three, especially three is when three is when they're going to get a lot of like big guests, you know, right. And people that still have some relevance now. That helps. I know uh, Stallone's coming help. up. It's certainly going to help. Yeah, Stallone is coming. His episode is maybe not a good example. Hey, Muppets, uh, how you doing? I'm uh, here to not. Okay, don't look at you. Don't look at the guys. All right, I'm not going to look at the guys. Look at the puppets. All right, whatever. Whatever. 
Suck it. But so I'm looking like at your hand eyes. <laughs> your hand eyes. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, well, music this week. Uh, chans- uh, Chanson de Moore. At the time, this was actually a contemporary hit and pop si- song in '77, shortly before this episode, uh, made popular by the Manhattan Transfer. I've heard of that. Yeah. Uh, the Boy I Love is Up in the Gallery. This is written by a guy named George Ware, and it was a British music hall song from the 1800s. Uh, it was made popular by this singer named Nellie Power, who was famous for being a burlesque and pantomime performer. She was so popular, in fact, that her funeral brought, uh, drew about 4,000 spectators. Damn. Glowworm, the song that you liked with the, the worm puppet, is from German composer Paul Lickne. I I tried Mm. Uh, who is known as the father of German operetta from his 1902 work that I'd heard of, but never actually heard uh, Lysistrata. Oh, I know. The worm is from Lysistrata. Oh, I mean, that's like an old Greek play, but I didn't know it was a musical eventually. Apparently Uh, this is a sketch uh, that actually originated on salmon friends, Jim's first TV show. Uh And he performed dozens of times over dozens of shows in multiple versions with different puppets, Uh, And that's it is a Muppet classic. And this may be one of its best performances. And you could just do that thing for any audience who speaks any languages, any any age group. It works perfectly for anyone. It's 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 Uh it's great. But they they'd done that. They'd been doing that sketch for 20 years by the time you saw them. Wow, that's amazing. Maybe 15. Yeah. Uh, singing in the raid main famous by Gene Kelly and also the impression that uh, Rich was kind of doing uh, fun fact while filming the titular singing in the rain sequence and spinning the umbrella and splashing through all those puddles. Gene Kelly had a hundred and three degree temperature. I did hear about that. And he somehow still did an amazing uh, performance. Well, did you ever from Cole Porter while this is known for the, uh, 59 film High Society with Bing Crosby and Sinatra. It was actually originally in a 1939 musical by Porter called DeBerry Was a Lady. <laughs> the story of a washroom attendant who wins the lottery, moves into high society, falls in love with a woman, gets so drunk that he has a dream sequence in which he becomes a Renaissance French king, wakes up from the dream, uses the rest of his money for pay- to pay for this woman's divorce, and then goes back to being a washroom attendant. I think Cole Porter was on acid. I don't know what the- I had to. I, thought, I was like, that's just too interesting for me to not talk about this weird musical. <laughs> that was very weird. Uh, I remember it well from the film Gigi. This was later performed on the Muppets Tonight episode uh, with Cindy Crawford and Kermit singing together. <laughs> Cindy Crawford could sing? Well, probably I, not. Probably not a Muppets Tonight. Uh, Jarman, what did you think was the best Muppeteering moment this week? I think I already gave it away, and that's the the lizard and the worm scene. It's a classic. And that is what I wrote, too, the glow worm sequence. It was just so It's so well simple, done. but it steals the show. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Jarman, uh, what Trek episode did we watch this week? So, we watched uh, the first episode of season two of Star Trek, uh, original series, and that's a mock time. Mm. A very popular episode amongst fans and critics alike. So starts off aboard the Enterprise. Spock begins to act strange, becoming easy to anger. He's not eating. He's isolating himself. And Spock requests to be able to take leave on his home planet of Vulcan to rest up. Apparently, they don't know why. But Kirk and Bones see one of his outbursts, which is very strange for him. But he's not emotional. And they agree to change course and take him to Vulcan. But then Kirk gets a message from Starfleet that he is to report the ship, the entire ship, immediately to an important presidential inauguration on some Federation planet for some reason. So Kirk changes course, but tells Spock, you know, we'll get there soon. But Spock goes behind his back and commands the crew to actually keep going to Vulcan. So Kirk finds out and confronts Spock, who says he has no memory of doing that, but he should probably be um, quarantined because he doesn't know what he's doing anymore and he's losing his mind. Um, So he seems further disoriented, agitated. So Kirk tells him, just go to sick bay. And once he's there, Bones finds out that in his current state, whatever that state is, because Spock won't tell Bones what's going on either, he won't live another week unless he gets to Vulcan and gets whatever cure or treatment he he's ta- won't tell anyone about. So Kirk, in a not very friendly way, um, basically badgers Spock until he tells him what the hell's wrong, even though Spock keeps telling him it's embarrassing. Uh, Vulcans can't tell anyone this, but he pulls it out of him finally. And he team- tells him that it's actually part of the Vulcan mating ritual called Pon Far. That if they don't take part in this mating ritual and mate, they die. Um, so suddenly things are very, the stakes are very high. So Kirk tries to contact Starfleet and ask them if he can go to Vulcan, but he can't tell them why. So they say, no, you can't do what you're supposed to be doing. 
So Kirk disobeys the orders as a good friend should, and he goes to Vulcan anyways. And so once he gets there, Spock invites Bones and Kirk to come down for the Ponfar wedding ceremony, where he's going to wed basically his mate that he was mated to when he was seven, which is kind of odd. They have like arranged mm-hmm. marriages from their seven years old. Um, so Spock tells him about that as well. And so his, his wife to Pring will be waiting there for him. So he rings a gong and in comes to Pring with um, the priestess to Pau, um, who comes over to deliver it. And she's famous in Starfleet because she's the only person who has ever turned down a seat on the Federation Council, which is pretty cool. Uh, Also played by a silent film actress um, who was famous in her own right. Um, I forgot her name, but it's on here somewhere. We'll find it. She had a lot of gravitas at the time, right? She did. Like, she didn't speak English very well, but she didn't have to during silent film era, so it didn't matter. That's true. Um, So anyways, uh, to everyone's surprise, Spock's future bride, T'Pring, refuses Spock and says instead that he must face the champion of her choice in battle. And if her champion wins, she can refuse his hand in marriage and then marry her real beau, Stan. Ooh, Stan. He's like a total loser, though. He was not impressive. He just want to punch him. He has a very punchable face. You might recognize his face because he played a a Romulan in an earlier episode. Uh, So if Spock wins, he can then force her hand in marriage or she can choose to abandon or he can choose to abandon the claim of marriage if he wants to, if he wins. So instead of choosing Stan as her champion, though, to fight for her, she surprised everybody by picking Kirk as her champion. So now, what does it do? oh my God. So now Kirk must fight Spock in armed combat. Um, he is told by T'Pau that he can just leave. He doesn't have to take part in this fight because he's not bound by Vulcan laws and customs. But Kirk decides to stay and fight because it's his friend. And he figures if anything, he can just let Spock win so that Spock can get his bride. But only after Kirk agrees to the battle, <laughs> T'Pau tells him, oh, it's actually to the death. So no, you can't do that great so kirk begins to fight spock the great music comes in (laughs) exactly and spock is now at the point of blood fever because he's uh just overwhelmed by the mating instinct and he just basically has to do this fight he can't even see straight he'll he'll kill kirk just to get his wife he doesn't even know what he's doing anymore but before he's about to fight bones warns kirk he's like well the there's less um, oxygen on this planet and it's so hot here. You'll, you'll barely last in this fight, but he's like, I got to go do it. So as he's fighting, he suddenly gets really winded and knocked down. And for some reason to pow stops the fight for a minute. I'm not sure why they don't really yeah, explain why I'm out. Yeah. She times out for some reason. Um, and bones takes this opportunity to ask to pow if he can give Kirk a shot that will make his lungs work better. And so he can at least have even footing with, with Spock. Um, and so to pow lets him do that. And soon thereafter, Spock beats Kirk in combat and kills him. (gasps) Oh, no. So Spock is now the acting captain of the Enterprise and a grief stricken bones asks him for orders because now what the hell am I supposed to do? So Spock tells him suddenly back to his regular um, unemotional self. He says, "Uh, just go back to the ship and I'll be there shortly and you can turn me into Starfleet for killing my captain. Um, So Spock then speaks to his future bride to Pring in a, a scene I really like where he asks her why she chose Kirk as his as her champion. And she tells him because by choosing Kirk, no matter the outcome of the battle, she would get what she wanted. If Kirk killed Spock, she would be with Stan. If Spock killed Kirk, he might still free her from the mating bond because he would be pissed at her for making him kill his best friend. So she could then be free to be with Stan still, or he would force her to marry him. And then while he's off on Starfleet adventures, she'd still be back on Vulcan boning Stan. So she got her way no matter what. So Spock congratulates her on her logic, um, which is very funny. He's like, oh, that's very logical. That's that's cool. And he releases her from the marriage. um, But he warns Stan. He's like that marrying this chick might not be all it's cracked out to be. And then he goes back to talk to T'Pau. And so towards the end of the episode, T'Pau tells him to live long and prosper, uh, to which he says he will do neither since he just killed his friend and his captain. Um, He goes back to the ship and Bones surprises him by revealing that Kirk is actually alive. That Jim. Bones, Jim. Oh, Jim. he just injected him with a paralytic agent so that he would appear dead. Um, and Spock is overjoyed, Jim, but quickly tamps down his emotions Gets in a very together. fun fashion. Yeah. And that's the end of the episode. Nice. <laughs> so, what'd you think of that? So, things I really like this week uh, Nurse Chapel appearance, which I appreciate more and more now that there are less of them. Yes. I like that they start us with something already going wrong. Mm. Like, we're in the, like, Spock is already in the situation. That's true. Um, and we just was Spock going to stab Kirk in that one scene? 
I think so. He was losing it. He was like Man, not remembering things. He picks up a knife. Something, yeah, and like has it behind his back, and I don't think Kirk sees it even. I had forgotten about that. And then Man, that was that was hardcore. Well, towards the end of the scene, he goes over to the comm and he kind of looks over and sees the knife and just kind of looks back and he's like, Okay, some shit's going down. I'm gonna get out of here. <laughs> uh things I disliked, mm-hmm. and this might get me some hate mail. Um I don't understand why this is considered one of the good episodes. <gasps> I don't get it. Ooh. I think Spock playing aggravated came off as childish too often, and then it made his other mood swing seem really weird. Hmm. The introduction of Chekhov in that terrible wig was just awful. <laughs> oh, Inconsistencies no. with Spock's behavior. Some of the time he's like a petulant kid, then he's near murderous, and then he blacks out, and then he's back to normal all of a sudden. It just made it really hard to like to understand what was happening. Hmm. Uh, the Vulcans for a race that hinge itself on logic. Uh, I feel like time and time again, they show that their society is devoted to b- blind ritual and mysticism that borders on magic and sorcery. Yeah, that's a fair assessment. People have, have made gripes about that in the past, that it's not very logical what uh, they follow. It feels like Spock really screwed them on this one as if he had told them more and not hidden everything. Kirk would have likely made better decisions there at the end. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Like he would know that the fight was to the death and that she could choose any champion she wanted. But instead, he didn't know that like a yup. Well, I guess he just didn't think they were that she was going to refuse him. So it wouldn't come up, I guess. That's on Spock. That is on Spock. <laughs> uh, it feels like the scene, the fight scene at the end may have built better if they had started with the sad rock nunchucks <laughs> and then graduated to the big blade. Things. the sad rock nunchucks <laughs> but it felt ridiculous to go to this from this thing that was clearly deadly right clearly meant to crush a skull or like cut someone open and graduate to like here's a scarf with two pine cones on it go at it boy. go to town so it just felt like it could have built a little bit better. that was actually the only part i turned to my girlfriend and then i was like the fight choreography in this could have used a lot of work um and the editing is just like it was slow and sloppy. It looked like two guys just fumbling around, not two trained fighters who like know how to handle themselves. It just uh, it was the, weird. The continuous jingling tambourine noise nearly drove me insane. <laughs> it just never stopped. It was always in the background. And then weird Wild West guitar music to go with the wacky he's not dead after all Wild West ending. <laughs> oh my uh, gosh. So this I I can just think of a lot of episodes, even from season one, that I think are are above this. I think some of your concerns are very legitimate and I won't downplay any of them, but this is one of my favorite episodes just because of the character moments between the characters, um, especially Bones, um, Spock and Kirk. And it even has those a great Sulu um, checkoff moments, which I like. That's true. They were really funny. That first taste of, of Chekhov's character. Yeah. Like, are we going back to Vulcan again? I don't know. You know, and then um, Nurse Chapel having some really like real moments there with Spock and her crying. Like, you just don't see much crying in Star Trek. There's no crying in Star Trek. There's no crying in space. <laughs> but uh, but some of the yeah, the things you said, there's some plot holes. There's some things that don't make a lot of sense. They, they could have like been more efficient with what kind of state of mind he was in exactly. I get that. That makes some sense. Yeah. But yeah. It was just hard to read. I get you. So Jarman, do we have any cool Trek factoids this week? Yes. And this is a kind of had a lot of groundbreaking stuff. So bear with me if this Ooh. episode, a lot of firsts, um, the first appearance of the Vulcan phrases, peace and long life, live long and prosper. Those together become like the tenet of, um, you know, salam alaikum, okay, alaikum salam kind of thing, you know? Right. Um, first call appe- and response. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's the first appearance of the Vulcan hand salute, which I didn't realize this was the first time they've used that. I thought that had already been around. Um, and as many Trekkies will know, uh, Leonard Nimoy improvised this symbol during the production of this episode. Um, he modified it from a traditional Jewish religious hand gesture because he is Jewish himself. And from that, it's become huge now to the point that it's an emoji that we got in a tweet earlier today. So there you go. Um, when we were in Portland, we went by a huge uh, Jewish temple that uh, had a giant stained glass of the live long and prosper symbol like, oh, in wow. its front window. That's a, there you go. It, it means, was great. I, I forgot what it means, but something like live long and prosper is what it means. Um, 
So the second season rarely featured Lieutenant Sulu, George Takei, and Ensign Chekhov, Walter Koenig, in the same episode because Koenig was, in fact, cast as Chekhov to fill in for Sulu because Sulu was in a movie called The Green Berets in 1968, so he was still filming some of that. Um, oh. So the characters usually alternate episodes, um, but this is one of the few times where they're actually just together playing off each other, and I think it's a great combination. I wish they could have done more mm. of that. Um, in the prequel series, uh, which I'm sure we'll watch someday, Star Trek Enterprise, um, they considered having one of their regulars um, as the younger version of T'Pau. Um, so those of you who have okay. seen Enterprise, they, they instead have T'Pol, T'Pol because they didn't want to pay the fee to the estate of the writer of a mock time to use the same character. Uh, they they were that cheap. <laughs> so they went from T'Pau to T'Pol. Good for them. So uh, also the, the woman playing T'Pau, the older woman who was the old silent film actress, was unable to make the Vulcan salute by herself. So they taped her fingers together for the nice. whole thing. Uh, this is the first ever Star Trek episode to feature any Vulcan characters other than Spock. And man, do they go all in because it's Vulcan centric. Uh, the same Romulan helmets are used in the, by the other, other Vulcans on the planet to save time and money for the instead of using ears. Uh, so that was funny. Uh, and Walter Koenig was not cast so much of his Russian language heritage or anything like that, but because they wanted more younger characters and they put him in a wig to make him look like the Davy Jones from the monkeys. Um, and after a few episodes, he eventually grows his hair out long enough. So he's not wearing the wig anymore, but it's very obvious in this episode. Um, and we have this is for our British listeners, which we have a lot of uh, the British pop group. Tapau took their name from this episode, <laughs> which I didn't know that was a British wow. pop group called Tapau. And the last thing we have is uh, Arlene Martell, who played T'Pring, the bride-to-be of Spock, said that William Shatner kept breaking her concentration on set by making lewd comments, uh, which makes sense. I can see that. (laughs) So, see, do we have any Trek connections or Muppet connections today? Oh, boy, are they tenuous this week. All right, so there's uh, a a, a company called ITG in the game. which does cards and memorabilia cells. And in 2011, they did a special run of famous Canadiana memorabilia uh, cards uh, that were not only cards, but some of them had autographs and pieces of jerseys from famous hockey team players and that kind of thing. Um, And it was a big thing to collect them and open them. I found a ton of content on this. It was kind of amazing. Hmm. Um, But uh, both Rich Little and Shatner are both Canadians. And there was a special double card in 2011 that featured Shatner and Rich Little in the same card and a cutout piece from both of their shirts. (laughs) That's so weird. One card together, a special double card they did for for ITG. Wow, that is a deep cut. That's right. And then both Nichelle Nichols and Rich Little have done the voices of their own heads on Futurama. In Rich Little's case, he was doing himself doing an impersonation of Howard Cosell. <laughs> wow, that's very odd. That's right. <laughs> uh, let's talk similarities this week. Yeah, uh, we have, I have some very weak similarities, but they're, they just came to mind. Um, in the At the Dance segment, Animal passes out, but is fine soon thereafter. Just like Kirk during the battle on Vulcan, he's uh, fine soon thereafter. Yeah. Wow, nice. Yeah. Both feature men sassily coming in and out of a doorway. Sassy Spock and Rich Little in the opener where he comes in and out as a bunch of different characters. <laughs> when was Sassy Spock? Oh, when he throws the plate. <laughs> oh, yeah. When he's like a teenager there at the beginning. I don't want soup. Um, so Crazy Harry destroys the set during the opening number in The Muppet Show, just as Kirk and Spock destroy the Vulcan set during their battle. Nice. Both involve people biting off more than they can chew. Lenny the Lizard with his worm monster and Kirk with the Vulcan death fight. <laughs> That's very true. Oh, man. Oh, what's that noise? Oh, no, wait, I got one more. Oh, I don't hear anything. What are you talking about? (laughs) Both involve, I just like the end of this one, so I have to say it. Both involve fighting over love, Piggy fighting Rich when she thought he was another female pig, and Spock being forced into a boner fight. (laughs) Cuz, let's be honest, that's what it is. It's a big old boner fight. Oh, now what? Oh, now I hear God. something. You set off the boner fight. <laughs> so now we have the transporter malfunction where we'll transport one character from one of the episodes to the other episode, whether it makes sense or not. Steve, what you got for us this from week? From Muppets to Trek this week, I've got Rich Little switching with Spock 
And as far as it's concerned, he'd just be coming in and instead of doing the pawn far, he just aggressively switches between irrelevant celebrity impersonations. <laughs> Bad irrelevant celebrity impersonations. Yes. Um, I have something similar. I have Spock would transport over and take Rich Little's place on The Muppet Show. And this is a little meta here, but um, Leonard Nimoy, the actor, should be the one doing the impressions. Not even necessarily because he would do better impressions, but because he played a magician, makeup artist, disguise guy oh, on did. Mission Impossible. <laughs> yeah. And anything would be better than some of these terrible Rich Little impressions. So that's why True. I did that. Uh, from Trex to the Muppets, I've got uh, we take three to Prings and replace the uh, the girls in the beginning being chased and blown up by Crazy Harry. <laughs> they had similar outfits, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty close. I can see that. Um, I would love to see Miss Piggy as to Pow, because she would just revel in being the queen like figure on Vulcan with half naked men true. serving her and barking out orders being bowed to and stuff. I'll so. allow it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Oh, that'd be great. So, yeah, that pretty much that pretty much covers it. And that brings us to the end of episode 30 of the Muppet Trek podcast. 30 episodes. Join, join us next week for the Muppet Show with special guest Edgar Bergen. Woohoo! And original series episode Who Mourns for Adonais. So from the lovers, the dreamers and us. Live long and prosper, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Muppet Trek podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media on Facebook and Twitter. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. This podcast has been brought to you by A Play on Nerds. <laughs>